that didn't respond are not here. Please be here. <laughs> the gift of life. The gift of life. God gave me this title. I don't even remember when. I wrote it down <clears throat> a couple of weeks ago. I was praying and the Lord began to speak to my heart about the gift of life and how we just take it for granted and how we just, we just live our lives and without really the reality of what has been given to us. We go through a lot of things and, and hurricanes come and pandemics and so forth and we, and we get into survival mode, right? And we get into rebuild mode and we, then we get into reconnecting mode and the next thing you know another storm comes. And, and then we're in re relationships with our family and friends and, and there's people in our lives that we love dearly that don't know the Lord and, and don't really care to know the Lord. And we just, we just forget if we not quite sure if we're forgetting or we just don't have the reality of how every breath we breathe, every moment that we are alive has come from God. You know... We just take things for granted, you know, we, we are born and we live and then one day we die. And we, we watch babies and grandkids and all, you know, born and, and then we watch loved ones that we know, you know, die. And this is our reality. We're living in, in this earth's reality. You know, I preached a message one time just talking about how on this planet here we have 365 days and then an added day every four years and so many day, hours in the day and so forth. And, and this, is, this is our reality because we live on planet Earth. But if you were to go to another planet, just even one in our solar system, your, your whole system would change. You know, the days, I mean, Mercury goes around the sun, its year is 88 days long. You know, Jupiter, I forgot what it was, but it doesn't matter. It's rotation and everything, everything would change and once we become born again, we become citizens of heaven. And because we become citizens of heaven, that's where we live. Now, I know that doesn't make any sense, not to the natural mind, that we live in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So, so our reality really isn't here anymore. But it can, it can be, just like the sin nature. Bible says a lot of really awesome things about life and how and how we uh, we 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 are not bound to the curse of this world. But what's weird is that we are we're not bound to the curse of this world as far as our soul and our spirit is concerned, but our body is still subject to the curse of this world. You know we're we're aging and we're and we eventually this body is going to wear out. It's going to die. So it's still part of this curse. The curse that came in was death. You know, but now we're living in life. It's a gift of God, eternal life. Our reality is not supposed to be here on this planet. You know, and it's kind of hard to, to push that aside when every day, you know, you've got your plan. You've got to take care of things, you know. Uh, cut your grass and fix your roof so after a storm and go to the grocery because it doesn't, the groceries just don't come to us. You see, but our reality really should be in heaven. You don't go to the grocery. Everything is provided. You see, but we don't, have, <clears throat> we don't have our reality based on that. And if we would, if we would just begin to try to connect to that reality, then even though you're going to grocery and you're still functioning in this life, you would be alive in heavenly places. You, you would know that the Lord is going to take care of you. He's going to provide for you. You know, Matthew, Matthew 6, 33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. What things? The things that the Gentiles seek. That's what Jesus told the people. Food, clothing, shelter, all these things. And then he goes into the fact that how God provides for the animals. How much more is he going to take care of you? And so we've been going through things like real fast. You know, the pandemic kicked in last year and the fear of this and the vaccines and the government and the election and on and on it goes. And then comes 
uh, Zeta last year, now, now Ida, and, uh, you know, and we know people that's got devastated from these storms. Last year was um, Lena, was it? The one that hit over in Lake Charles, Laura, you know? Laura. Laura, yeah, Laura. <laughs> and uh, all these names, right? They had like, went so far in the Greek alphabet, we almost ran out of names. And things are getting bad out there as far as that too, you know? I mean, earthquakes and, and volcanoes erupting and, and um, just tons of stuff going on. Places that never seen floods before being flooded. Places that normally have a lot of water are running dry. Fires that are twice as much acres burned this year than the previous years and doubled, it doubled in, over in the West. And, and man, on and on it goes, just the stuff to awaken us. And the thing that needs to happen is, is that these things in life need to awaken us on who we are in Christ. Amen. Who are we? Why, what does it mean to be saved? You're going to heaven? You know? Why are we, then why did he just take us home when we died right. then? Right. I mean, when we, when we got saved, rather, we get saved and just kill me and off I go. You know? But no, you're here. How many of y'all here right now? Here. Some of y'all, Daniel's not here. <laughs> Daniel has left the building. It's, it's a precious, precious gift that God has given us of life. I mean, it's stressing to even live on this planet. And, and, and our bodies are constantly breaking down to the place where our focus gets on ourselves. And I see, I mean, it does. You get a headache and you don't want to talk, you know, you know, you get migraine and you, you take an Anison and, and well, Anison, I don't even have that anymore. <laughs> You're taking Tylenol, you're taking ibuprofen, and, and on and on it goes. You, you, you're doing whatever it takes. My dad was in pain. He had a, um, an ulcer, and that ulcer began to flare up. So he took Advil, and it wouldn't go, and the pain wouldn't go away, so he took it. It wasn't a bleeding ulcer, though. And he kept taking until he took half a bottle, and then he started bleeding out. And three days later, he went home to be with the Lord. And as we were gone, I was walking with the surgeons for them to go and try to find the vein to, to cut it off, so I mean, to stop that vein from, because where the bleeding was coming, and it was like, he said, let me tell you right now, he told me, that the surgeon, that you got about an 80% chance this is not going to work. But we have to try something, because we can't just keep pumping blood into his body. He said, I need your permission. He said, well, you got it. You know, we got, we, yeah, he can't lay in bed and just, you constantly just put blood in, you can lay here and what? rest of his life, how long that may be. Well, it didn't work, of course, but as we were walking to the surgery room, uh, two surgeons was kind of in front of me, and I just, I said something, I forgot what I'd said, and he turned around, looked at me, and went, Advil did this. He said, it, it ate the lining out. He said, this also was not a bleeding ulcer until it ate the lining out of his stomach, and then it began to bleed, and we can't stop it, we have to try to stop the vein. So, but he was very, strong in my face about it. Advil did this, you know. So when we're having pains and we're having problems in our lives, you know, we, it's, a, it's, a, it's a natural thing to get focused. I mean, y'all know that's true. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if I, I'll work this out right now and then I'll get back to praying. I'll work this out and I'll start going back to church. I'll, you know, I'm going to handle this family relationship on my own. If it doesn't work, then I'll see counsel and something, you know. And so we, it's always what we, we are, actually we've been manufactured by God fearfully and wonderfully to the place where because of the curse, because of, the, of sin, we're now taking this, all this, this fearful and wonderful things God has created us into that is designed to lean 100% and to be totally filled with God's presence. Amen. And we were designed for that. We are a building, a house, given a, a, a real being, a body, we were in our real being ourselves, our, our spirit, my soul, but we were to be inhabited by God. You know, the whole center and core of our being, but then comes the sin nature, and now all of these wonderful attributes are totally focused on self. And, and there's no way really around it. It's just going to happen. It's a natural thing because these gifts are perfect. These gifts that God has given us are divine. They're perfect. They cannot be changed. 
but they can be manipulated. Okay? So the wonderful gift of life cannot be changed. Even for an unsaved person, it, it can't be changed. They're going to stand before God and pay account and what they've done in their flesh. Amen? And so you, you can't change it. But because they are unsaved, it can be manipulated. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? Yeah. They use it for their own self-glory. Yeah. You see, all these, all these gifts and these callings and these abilities and everything that, that God has graciously given us and made us into who we are was totally designed for his pleasure. Yeah. That's what the scripture says. You were created for God's pleasure. But because of the sin nature, we now take all that and we begin to use it on our own pleasure. We manipulate all the gifts of God. And so then we are so wrapped up on ourselves and so wrapped up in this world that God takes, whether we want to or not, he's definitely taken second or third place behind all the different things. If I just get this right first, you know. I mean, churches are emptying out all over the country. And I know why. It's, you know, having this reality, this, this revelation, I know why it's emptying out, because everybody is trying to do their thing, whether it's solve their own problems before they come back to God, or just busy, just wanting to enjoy life. Life, right. life is just too bad, so now I just need more time to try to get happy. Amen. Amen. I hope you all understood what I said. Yes. Yes. Romans 6. This is the New Life version. It, um, but now you are free from the power of sin. See what it says? You're free from the power of sin. Sin has no more power on you. But how many of y'all have sinned recently? I put my hand up. You know, anything less than faith is sin. So right off the bat, if you're in, if you're in fear or you're worried or something, you're, you're not walking by faith. So you, you're walking and living in sin. You know, like... Like uh, Job said, he said, the very things I fear the most have come upon me. Mm -hmm. So he owned a lot, a lot of stuff, right? A lot of cattle and so forth. They had a lot of servants and, and everything. And, and uh, so the whole time, he's fearful that thieves are going to come and steal it. I mean, anybody in this church that has something, then you can understand that Job's fear was that he would... He, some. Armies would come in or whatever and just steal their ca his cattle and kill his servants. This was something that he always feared. But God had this hedge around him to protect him. Until one day, God decided to lift the hedge and let the devil at him. And what did the devil do? Exactly what Job had been fearing all the time. Took yep, took everything away. The armies came in, killed the servants. His children died. He feared that his children would have sin when they did their, their parties that they were doing. So he would sacrifice animals because he was fearful that his children would have sinned and judgment would have come. Roof fell in on him and killed them all. You know? So living in this world produces something because God's gifts are perfect, but they can be manipulated. So God had given him tremendous gifts, tremendous wealth. He took it all away in one day. Why? Because, because Job was not a righteous man. He was a righteous man. You and I are righteous people. And that's only because you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that righteousness is not based upon how much you read the Bible, or how many you know, prayers you say each day, or whether you wake up and tell God good morning, or you go to bed and tell God good night. It's not based on any of that. It's based on the fact that you've come to the cross. You've come to Christ. Yeah. You understand that? Yes. Now, when you begin to develop and begin to have skill in your life to pray and to talk to God, you will, you will better yourself to the place where your fears will begin to, to leave and faith will begin to start coming. Amen. But whether you ever achieve that has nothing to do with your salvation. That's right. You're either in God or you're not, period. 
Now, can a person lose his salvation? Yeah, he can walk away. And if God's dealing with somebody to, to come out of sin and they don't, that could be a pretty serious thing too. The church in Sardis was told, I'll keep your name in the Lamb's Book of Life as long as you keep doing what I'm telling you to do. So when you know to do good and you do not, the Bible says it's sin. Right. He who knows to do good. But some people are ignorant. The Bible says it's better for you not to know to turn away. So it says here, but now you are free from the power of sin. You don't, you don't even have to sin no more. But yet we do. But you don't have to. You've been set free. But yet the temptation comes and it's strong. And your, and your mind starts lusting for it. And the battle begins to go. Your anger, your whatever it might be, be a, a fearful. When the pandemic hit, people freaked out and was fearful. I might die. I was a Christian, so be it. I don't care about dying. I do care about being laying in a bed paralyzed or something like that. I don't want to be that. <laughs> I'd say, shoot me. <laughs> so we're free from the power of sin. You have become a serp. Everybody say servant. Servant. So we've been freed from the power of sin, and now we have become a servant to God. It's interesting. So before this, we were a servant to sin, but now we become a servant to God. Hmm. So what I'm saying to you about the gift is perfect, but it can be manipulated. So... And now you've been free from being a servant to sin. I'm adding that in there. And now you have become a servant to God. So the idea is that we were using the perfect gift of being a servant. We were created to serve God. Period. and a story. You wasn't created to go off and build you some house on top of some mountain. You wasn't created to go out there and do... Now, if you own things, that's great, but... You see, you weren't created to, for that. You were created to be a servant of God, to reveal, have God revealed in you to a dying world. But even before that, when Adam and Eve was, was created, they were perfect. God was in them. All the gifts given were, were just revealing God through the nature of Adam and Eve. Then they sinned and began to take all those perfect gifts and began to use them, manipulate them. And the gifts are still perfect. That's why we have problems in our life. Because you cannot deny. God cannot deny himself. And his gifts are perfect. They cannot be denied. They can be manipulated into a place that they're going to cause you problems. Because they're perfect. You know, a rat trap doesn't care if a possum gets in it. It's been designed to catch something at a certain size. I know, I've caught a young possum in a rat trap in my yard one time. <laughs> so it, the, the trap didn't distinguish between a rat or a possum. It just goes off. It'll catch your foot, you put your foot in there too. And you know, that's how God's laws are, his principles and who he is and his gift of life and everything. They're perfect. You, you can manipulate them. I keep saying it because that's the point here. When you're sinning, you're using a gift God's given you, but now you've manipulated them to justify your sin. I need some happiness. Therefore, I'm going to override the happiness comes from God, and I'm going to go get what I want to make me happy. And then it's but a season. Because if you're born again, really born again, you're going to be guilty about that. Yeah. You're going to feel that guilt. If you're not feeling guilt about some sinful things you're doing, boy, I would really check out my heart and find out if I'm even still in the hands of God. You know? Your life is set apart for God-like living. Amen. The end is life that lasts forever. You get what is coming to you when you sin. It is death. But God's free gift is life that lasts forever. It is given to us by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here the scripture is talking about eternal life. When you became a born again believer, 
you got eternal life. But the gift is perfect. It's been given to all men. But we have the eternal life. Everybody say eternal life. That's what you have. But the gift is perfect. They have life out there too. Are you with me? Because they've been manipulating the life, they're going to have eternal death. You see, the, the gift of life is eternal. People say, well, I don't God just wipe out the wicked. You know, they, they finish, they die, they just cease to exist like an animal. Because we have the gift of eternal life. Animals do not have the gift of eternal life. So when a person is born as a human being, they are given the gift of eternal life right there on the spot. The moment they were conceived, the moment they started to, to move and breathe, there's something so tiny, you know, the human eye can't even see them. They're just two cells separating. They were given eternal life. The people that who have manipulated eternal life have eternal death. They cannot cease to exist because it's the gift of God and it's perfect. It's perfect. You see, we, we have to come to the reality that we have, we have two minds in our heads. We have a carnal mind, the human mind, the sinful mind, and we have the, we have the mind of Christ. That happened when you got saved. You were given the ability to know right from wrong, to know that what you were doing wrong. Immediately at 4 o'clock in the morning when I gave my life to the Lord, she was at a funeral in, in Grammar's house by myself. Immediately I knew that I had to stop doing. Immediately. I got to stop doing this. I got to stop doing that. I got It just, I knew I had, and there was no way that I could just stop. Because my carnal mind, is what the, it was the only mind that I was living with and upon and using and so forth until now all of a sudden I knew that that stuff was wrong. You know, when Christians tell me they, they're born again and yet they, they have no problem still doing what they were doing that is evil and corrupt and wrong, then I challenge their salvation. I am not the God to say you, that they're saved or not. But I challenge their salvation to the place of, you know, why are you doing what you're doing? Well, I just don't think it's wrong what I'm doing. Then I would check the spirit out that you say you got born again with. Because I immediately, and so did every other, every born again believer that I know that I've ever sat down and talked with, knew, they knew what had to go, leave their life. They knew it. That doesn't mean that they, that they abided by it and that they stopped doing it. Because a lot of that stuff was quite a fight. Quite a fight. It's so interwoven. And it's not going to stop because the scripture tells us that the man planted good seed and, and weeds came up with it. And the servant said, didn't we plant good seed? And he said, yeah. And he said, let, let us go and pull up the weeds. He said, no, you can't. Because the roots are all intertwined with the, the good and the bad. And at the, and at the end... It's all going to be, the, the weeds are going to go and get burnt and the good stuff into the bonds. And so your carnal nature, your carnal mind, and your mind of Christ has a root system down in your being. And those roots are interwoven. And when we stop manipulating God's gift, you will become powerful with the mind of Christ. But our, our, our tongue will, will bless the curses and our hearts will deceive us, and our, our carnal mind will try to override the mind of Christ, and it will want its way. Amen? Yes. Did I finish this one? Yes. <laughs> I get going. I forget where I am. Death. Now, what is death? Everybody dies, including Christians. And you see them in the coffin, or they're in the urn, whatever. Death, separation from God. That is what true death is. Totally cut off from God and from, you know, and from 
who he is and what he is and all that he is and all that he is, separation from happiness, joy, and peace. That's just three things. But there's so many things that we are, that we are cut off from God with that produce a sin. Those lines are jumping, huh? Good deal. So, this is what the definition of true death is. You know, I've seen many people in the coffin, and you probably have too. I've did quite a few funerals in my 33, 30, almost 34 years of ministry. And I always wonder, because as a minister, especially when doing the funeral, are they really in heaven? Everybody wants, to, wants me to tell them that their loved one's in heaven. Well, I can say this, they went to heaven, but that doesn't mean that they're there. <laughs> I wouldn't say that, though. I'd get stoned, you know. But, yeah, the, everyone stands before the judgment seat of Christ and pays account of the deeds done in the flesh. You're not, you can't escape it. It's inevitable. If you're born again, it's going to be a bittersweet judgment that you will face. It's going to be bitter because you're going to have your life flash before you. Instantly, you're going to see everything you did. I mean, instantly your brain is going to comprehend every good and bad thing that you have ever done instantly. Say, I don't remember saying that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's going to be in your face. And the sweet part about it is, is that your whole life is thrown in the fire. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And every bad thing is burnt up wood, hay, and stubble. And even if all you got is good, bad, is, is, we, is uh, wood, hay, and stubble, like leading somebody to the, to the Lord while they're in the hospital dying, and, I, and only hours later they go home and be with the Lord. I've had that happen. Right. Saved them on the last, the last seconds of their life, got saved. Well, everything would have burnt up. Right. But their salvation will remain. That's awesome. Yeah. On a deathbed, they can come to Christ and go to heaven. Yeah. Say, but I know what they've done, you know. I know when my dad died and, and the Lord said he's with me now, I accepted that because I heard it and the nurse heard it too. And, uh, but I knew, I knew all the bad things. And even, even now at times, he's been gone since 2013. But even now and then, when I'm just trying to go to sleep, laying there on, on the pillow, and, and I start thinking about people that have gone, and I go, man, I hope my dad's there. Anybody in your life like that? You just go, I just hope he's there. And then comes the conversation, because my brain kicks in, and the Lord starts having a conversation with me. He said, oh, so now your dad's salvation is based on all good and bad works now. Immediately, I mean, my brain goes right to that. And then I say, my dad is in heaven. Amen. My dad had accepted the Lord. You know, prayed a prayer with me that he really meant. He cried. I mean, he was, I've never seen my dad like that ever in my life. So I knew true salvation had come based on that cross, not on any good work that he ever could have possibly done. And I, even after he had come to the Lord, which was, um, I forgot how long before his death it was, but um, when he came to the Lord, amen. i never forget that day. I led him to the Lord in the hospital. That night we had church, and I went up to the pastor, Brother Walker, and I began to tell him, my dad got saved, and the reality hit me, and I couldn't talk. I just started crying. I was how easy it is for someone to get saved. But even after that, he still did not live right. And so here I am in that room. He's now gone, and nights when I'm sleeping, and I'm going kind to of go to sleep, and I'm thinking about from the time he said that, what we call a sinner's prayer, and, and he meant it, the time of his death, that there was just so many bad things that that begins to run in my mind. You know, how can he be in heaven? And quickly the Lord says, because of my grace. Right. He said, son, I love you and you're perfect. 
but your flesh will never enter heaven. It's corrupt. It's rotting. It's like rotten meat to the Lord. Heading for death. But your spirit is perfect. It's alive. It's been quickened by my spirit. You now have the gift of eternal life. Your dad had that gift. And he's, in, he's here with me. I don't care. Bible, as a matter of fact, one situation, a young man just couldn't believe he could go to heaven. All the bad things he had done. Even before he died, he was texting his grandmother and telling her, I know I'm dying, and, and, I, but I'm no, and I know I'm going to hell. And I had so many conversations with him and everything. But there was one scripture that came alive when she told me that. Scripture in 1 John it says, if your heart condemns you, God's greater than your heart. Because the gift of God is perfect, but it can be manipulated. And how I mean it? I mean it like this. The young man thought he was going to go to hell because of all the bad works. He was manipulating God's true life, that God was greater than his heart. He was forgiven, and that's where he is in heaven, period. There's no argument in it. Death is a separation from all of that. Now, life is living forever with God. That's the definition of life. And having all that is, that he is. Having, I mean, we have no clue. Like it says in uh, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9, Eye is not seen nor ear heard the things God has prepared for them that love him. Verse 10 says, but God's revealing it to us by his spirit. God is speaking to us and, and telling us about some things. And, but yet, when we get there, we're going we're gonna to spend the first billion years with our mouth hanging. How wonderful. I'm just kidding, though. That's going to be on video. There is no time. It's all over. We're here, we, our, our planet revolves 24 hours a day, or almost 24 hours, and so forth. But heaven has no time. So we will be in that reality forever. The reality of it is. Anybody got a loved one that went to heaven? Come on. You miss them? You'll see them again. It was based on salvation. People who reject Christ will not be there. But yet, we will not, it will not diminish the joy that we'll have. Our minds will be full, just full of revelation and truth. We will totally understand and comprehend it. But now, it, it would be a painful thing to know that a loved one rejected Christ, and they're not going to make it. You won't be in heaven just so upset over it. Nah. Because you will understand what took place and what happened with that person. John 10.10, 10, the Amplified, it says, The thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. Now, everybody know this scripture? But for the thief, which is the devil, he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But the Lord has come to give us life and give it to us abundantly. Um, this is a scripture I've heard so many times as a Christian growing up in the Lord. And I read this chapter so many times as a chapter the Good Shepherd. But I got this, like a new revelation about it for this message. Where the truth and God's life and gifts are perfect, but they can be manipulated. Now here's the deal with this scripture. The thief comes... To manipulate the truth. He comes to, to change the thinking about what God has written. Right. The proof? He possessed a snake in the garden. God said, don't touch the tree. You can eat of anything you want in this garden, but don't touch the tree. It's mine. Leave it alone. Don't. Just leave it alone. Because if you do... What did, it, what did God say? You will die. 
Not only, see, he didn't even comprehend what that meant because he didn't die right away when he ate of it. But he doesn't even realize that he was getting older now and he was going to die, but he still didn't realize that he caused the whole human race to experience death. Wherever he is right now, he definitely understands it. But he was the, the beginning of, of all things in human. And so then here comes the devil who manipulates the truth. Truth is perfect. Because he said, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God. And you shall not die. Manipulation of the truth. Because the truth is the wicked will continue to live for eternity. But it's not called living etern eternal life. It's eternal death. So he manipulated the truth. He didn't change the truth. He just simply manipulated it. Does somebody understand what manipulation means? Yes. You know, maybe I should have put that definition up there. You know, to manipulate the truth is to take the truth to another location and give it a new definition. But the truth is still a truth, just like the rat trap. It's going to go off. You know, when something small enough to get in it, it's going to go off. It might be called a rat trap, but it will catch a person who's a rat <laughs> trying to steal your cheese. So, so the devil manipulated the truth. You shall not die. That was a truth because they were only thinking, see, first off, they didn't even understand what dying meant mm -hmm. because all they've ever experienced, Adam and Eve experienced life. But then the devil comes, and they had told, God had told them, you shall die. But God could not, let's say it this way. Adam and Eve were perfect. Therefore, when God said, you shall die, they instantly knew what it meant. Right. See, they didn't know to that point. God said, you'll die. So inside of their being, they understood I would be separated from God. But then the devil comes along and he says, you'll be like God. Manipulation. Because it was still, he wasn't lying, he wasn't twisting, he wasn't changing its message. But he didn't say, you'll be separated from God and you will be God. So, he told him the truth. You're going to be like God to know good and evil. But up until this point, everything that they ever learned <clears throat> immediately went into their being as God spoke it. As God walked with them and taught them, it went in and it was understood. Now, because of manipulation, because of what we do with our own life, we, we have a real hard time trying to understand the Word of God. I read the Bible, but I don't understand it. Join the club. <laughs> because there's no way in the world that you're going to read the Bible that's, that's logos, written word, and really get its meaning. What did Paul mean when he said, the joy of the Lord is my strength? What did, what did he mean by that? It meant no matter where you find yourself, in prison, in life, in sickness, paralyzed, which would be in prison of your body, and on and on, no matter where you find yourself, understanding that you're going to be free, and knowing Christ, and you have eternal life, will make you happy even in the midst of that. I don't want to be in any of those predicaments, and I wonder if I, if I am or I become that way, would I really, truly have the joy of the Lord? Right. I don't want to find out. Anybody here wants to find out? But the idea is that what, okay, is we separate the thief and Jesus in this, in this scripture. We see that the thief, the devil, is manipulating truth. But truth is perfect. He's not changing. He can't change. It's impossible. Now, you have to change God for truth to be changed. 
But there's another way at looking at things that manipulates it. The truth is still going to, it's, it's going to come through. Understand? But then when Christ, he says, have life in heaven more abundantly, he's talking about no manipulation. Just believe in the pure truth. That as that truth grows inside of you, it will begin to bring abundance into your life. You don't have to have millions in the bank to be rich. You don't have to have, you know, a perfect body to enjoy perfectness. That's, that's what truth's all about. It's like that guy, I forgot his name, Wayne will probably, top of his head would say his name, that was born without arms, hands. And anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I forgot the guy's name, but anyway, he, w he, he was trying to drown him, just trying to die. Threw himself in the water, and somebody, I think, jumped in and saved his life, and then he got, he got saved. And now when you look at him, you, you would think, oh, that poor guy. But the man is just filled with so much joy. Amen. The joy of the Lord. You want to understand, go look that guy up on YouTube and, and listen to him. Yeah. And you will understand what it means to be in the prison of this body and not be able to do what normal people can do and yet have joy unspeakable and full of glory. Amen? Amen. Amen. How many of y'all know who I'm talking about? We'll have to get a video of Men. 2 Timothy 1. For God saved us and called us to life, to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it, but because that was his plan from before the beginning of time. Now it's interesting. Paul tells Timothy this particular statement. God's plan was for us to be, to be filled. Now, since the beginning of time. So then we gotta, we gotta jump all the way back in the beginning of time. I wasn't there, so, and neither were you. Actually, no one was there, no angels, nothing. Except God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And I picture in my mind, they'd, let's create a table and chair so we can sit down and talk. <laughs> I don't know, just float on a cloud. We don't have clouds yet, didn't make them. Let's make some clouds to sit on. Whatever, wherever they were in eternity past, they existed and they in perfect agreement because the truth is perfect. And they have come to a conclusion, how they thought about it, who knows? They're God. Don't even try to figure out the mind of God. Try to figure out your own mind and that's hard enough. And, uh, but they say, okay, we're going to we're going to do a creation. We're going to create. We're going to create because we are God, and together we are God, one singular, and we want to make, we want to create. This is what we are. To, to not create would have to, they would deny themselves. You know, you do what you do because you would have to deny yourself, even if it's good or bad, doesn't matter. You'd have to deny yourself to not do it, right? Well, they're God, and they couldn't deny themselves, so we're going to create. And, they, and it was all laid out in their minds. They knew exactly what they were going to do. They were going to create perfect beings. But they would not be perfect if they could not make a choice. Okay? So whether we have full free will or limited free will doesn't matter we have free will, period. Right. I don't care what the Calvinists say, we have free will. Right. Amen. That's right. Even though we all have some kind of Calvinistic beliefs in us, I mean, it's just there. Because of our free will, we can, we can believe to be Calvinists, Armenians, and all the other religious things that's out, you can just choose to be that if you want. But anyway, so we're gonna create angels, we're gonna create human beings, we're gonna create all things he creates, he created that we don't even know about, who knows what's on other planets out there or whatever, um, and we're gonna create them. But the moment we give them choice, they can become like us. So when Satan said that to him, you see, he was not lying. 
All he was doing was manipulating the truth. You shall be like God. Well, God even said that. In one of the Psalms, he was telling the Pharisee of Jesus, and he said, is it not written that you are gods? It's a little G, of course, which, which means servants. But the Bible says that it wouldn't have been robbery for Jesus to be equal to God. But he pushed that away and became a servant even unto death. So he can pay and, and bring us back into relationship with God. So we're going to make, we're going to make beings with free natures, free wills, free thought, everything. We're going to reveal ourselves to them and let them make a choice. And then the end result will be that they would come to us or not. But what will we do? First he created angels. Then he created hell. And the Bible says, Jesus said that, the de that hell was created for the devil and his angels. And for whoever else is manipulated by him to wind up there. A holding place until they go into the lake of fire. So right here he says, from the beginning of time, when they were, before they were, God was creating anything, his plan was to fill humanity up. But I want to. See, Adam was created and was filled with God. He didn't have a choice. Angels were created and, and they were, they have God. I don't know if they have God the way we do, but they didn't have a choice to be what they are. You and I have had a choice. Adam and Eve didn't have a choice. They were born, God created them, him, her from the rib, him from dust, and then he put their spirit inside, and they were able to come into him so that when he would speak to him, he could understand because God was in them, in them and out of him. Figure that one out, but anyway. And so God's plan was to bring this thing all the way to the end and let, and let their free will, which would produce sin, and separation, and let it, let it rain all the way to the end when it's all said and done, so that the people that would be filled with God would want to be filled with God. How many of y'all want to be filled with God? That was God's plan from the start. You wanting to be filled with God. That's, I mean, it's, it, it let me say it this way. It's simple. It's very complicated because it involves trillions and trillions and trillions and, you know, the number's bigger than that of beings that existed and people that have lived on the earth in order to come up with a group of people that wanted to be, totally wanted to be filled with his presence and live an eternal life. He knows the exact number that has to exist to get the number he's looking for, whatever that is. I believe it's the number of those fallen angels, the placement for them. But I don't know what number that is. So, And when that number is filled, that's with aborted babies. That's with babies that die on their own in the womb. And that's from born-again believers. All of that is that number. That's a lot. But he knows how many have to be born. So... They say one believer to like a hundred that, that wind up in hell. And they don't wind up there unless they don't want and reject Christ. So, God's plan from before the beginning of time to show us his grace through Christ Jesus. Amen. And now he has made all of this plain to us by the appearing of Jesus Christ, our Savior. He broke the power of death <clears throat> and illuminated the way to life and immortality through the, through the good news. Amen. And this is a New Living Translation. But I like <clears throat> this right here, this, this last line. Illuminated, illuminated the way to life and immortality through the good news. Now, let me ask you a question. How did you get saved? Don't all answer me at one time. How did you get saved? illumination, light. Light came on and at some point in your life you knew you needed to be saved. 
God illuminated that, and he's illuminating it to everybody out there. I don't care where they are. And it might be on their deathbed in some, some tribe out in the jungle somewhere that's worshiping all kind of stuff that God is going to illuminate the God, the true God of all. And they'll have a choice to make. So you got saved because of this illumination, this light that came on that showed you you needed to get saved. Amen? Amen. First Peter says, for the scriptures say, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who are right in his ears or open to their prayers, but the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. This is plain and simple. How I many of y'all, you want to enjoy life? Not enjoying it a lot lately? Pandemics created fear in your life? Pains in the body has, has stopped you in your tracks? Relationships have failed in your life? Been thinking about maybe quitting church, quitting the Lord, just giving up? I've quit many a time. Right. Yeah, I just quit. <laughs> Then Sunday comes and I'm back in the pulpit preaching. <laughs> I just quit. I can't live this life. No, you can't. Right. We need God in us, the hope of glory. Amen. Stand to your feet, please. Now, I know this will be a question everybody probably say yes, but only you could really know. Did you understand what I'm saying? Now, I know that some things got a little deep and maybe you got confused and so forth, but I guess to, to sum it all up is that you were created to be filled with God. You were created to have eternal life. God loves you, gave his son on a cross so you could come back into relationship with him and you could live a good life free of fear, doubt, and worry, and all these things. Even though when they come, you say, I thought I was free of this stuff. It will shake you to your core. God will let it happen just so that you'll come running back to him so that you would just, just dive at his feet and embrace him. How many of y'all this morning would say, I need, to be, I need to be refilled. I need to come back to that truth. I need help getting this, this junk out, the fear, the worry, the doubt, the anxiety. Come on up to the front. Sometimes we just need to make a move. We just need to get out from the chair. You know, the ladies went on to a, a retreat, a getaway. And Julie was telling me about <clears throat> some awesome things, how just getting away, how it's so different than here in the church. You know why? Because y'all going on the getaway knowing what y'all going to be doing. You know that this is going to, we go on that, we're not going on there because we're on vacation. And I listen to her, she tells me year after year, and you ladies know what you're expecting when you go. And it, and it happens. God shows up. But when it comes to church, it's kind of a different reality in church. Well, you know, got children's church going on, Debbie's got to deal with that. <laughs> got teachers in there not hearing a message, and it's church is being run differently from something like that. It's just different. People come in here, and their house is down the street, you know, you got things going on, you got doctor's appointments coming up, you got, you know, I to hit, I still got things I got to do, I got to put my doors back up on my shed for like the fifth time, and uh, <laughs> you know, still got some shingles to fix over here on this side, I got all those thoughts, and, and like a checklist. And so, but when you get away, you're away from your environment. I mean, likes vacation, you know, but you're away from home. And you just begin to enjoy your vacation. Well, you know, no matter where you are in life, if you're here in church and everything, is that you can escape the reality of where we are and be in the reality of heaven. You know, when I, read, I did my cabinet business, I was pastoring the church for 14 years, and... 
I mean, sometimes we had Royal Rangers, and I'd show up on Thursday night, I mean, exhausted. And I had all those, we had all the boys, we had about 20-something boys, and um, I would get up and I would play my guitar and, and I get, get, actually got the boys singing. God's presence would come down on a Thursday night, and we didn't even do Royal Rangers. The boys would literally, some of them would go sleep under the chair. God's presence would come over these kids and we'd minister to those kids. My tiredness would flee. When I got home, I was, I was exhausted again. But at that moment of time, because God was well pleased. You know, God is well pleased in what you're doing. I know you're busy. You're busy dealing with your loved ones, dealing with things. God is well pleased. And that's, that's what makes it even more important for you to just come, just, just rest in the Lord, to just come and and just embrace him. He knows that your loved ones, in many cases, are not right with God, and it's stressing you out because you want to see him in heaven. Right? I mean, you're on a page with me. You know what I'm talking about. It's just overwhelming that I know I'm going to heaven, and then I know some people that are not, and that's, that's grieving. Pastor in this church for so long, and knowing some people um, that are just not right with God. It's painful. I just want them to know the, the life that I have in me, the joy. It's not always easy, but it's worth it. I say, I, if I ever got saved again and got to go back in time and then live it over, I may, what would I change? And I started to think about everything and every experience I've, that involved learning about God, having the children, the pastor of the church, and, and different people. I wouldn't change anything. Well, maybe there'll be one or two things that I want to change, some relationships, but I wouldn't change the way God orchestrated it to reveal himself. And I know that if I live a little longer on this earth, I'm going to, he's going to reveal himself even more. Amen. Some of y'all, y'all just need that. You just need, a, you need him to reveal himself to you this morning. Some of y'all just need to cry out. Just reach up and grab his hands. And he'll lift you up. Amen? You just need that time of refreshing. <clears throat> time of refreshing in the Lord. He loves you with an everlasting, eternal life. He knows what you're facing. He knows what you've gone through. He knows the pains in your body better than your doctor. And he wants to touch you this morning. He knows. He, Danny, he knows about your phone situation, Danny. Janice, he knows what's going on in your life. Listen, he knows all about you. Yes, indeed. And I could say that to everybody in here. He knows. He knows. And when it's all finished, you're going home to be with him forever. You have eternal life. You have a gift that's been given to you that he's not taking that gift back. If you want to give it back, that's your business. But he's not going to take it back. He loves you with an everlasting love. I just want to anoint you this morning. And I'm going to pray, and we're going to pray and ask God for that refilling. As I was walking in front of y'all and anoint you, the scripture came to my mind out of Colossians 3. <coughs> if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. The Christ sits at the right hand of God. You need to seek those things that are above, people. And seek those things. You have no idea what you'd be seeking, but God will begin to give that to you. He'll begin to open up your eyes. You need your eyes open this morning. You need to see those things that are above. It says, set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For your life is hid with Christ in God. Mm. Close your eyes for just a minute. Father, we cry out for you. We cry out for you. We, just, we seek your face, Lord, this morning. We want to be separated from our duties and our jobs and the things that that we know we have to go home and do. We just want to be in your presence so that we can, we can be just 
change in our thinking to be always dwelling and thinking about being with you one day for eternity. We lose sight of that and then the world overwhelms us. But we need to grab hold of it and we need to be reminded we have eternal life, but we know some that do not. We know that we need to just keep our affections on you so that it will begin to radiate off of us like a light bulb, the heat from a light bulb. And those loved ones will not only feel it, but they'll begin to kind of understand what you have, and they will begin to want it. We thank you, Father, for the gift of eternal life. We thank you for all the gifts and all the callings. We thank you, Lord, for making us who we are. We are uniquely made, fearfully and wonderfully. And you knew us when, the, when conception was made. You knew us before conception ever happened. You knew everyone even before you started creating. And your plan was to inhabit us with your grace and with your mercy, with your holy presence. And Lord, we just cry out to you this morning that our minds will be cleared of this world and we will become heavenly minded. But Father, please refill us. Fill us up this morning. Shake us down in our core. And let that joy of the Lord begin to to just overflow, that people would want that joy. We give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Tell somebody, Jesus loves you. <laughs>